Hi, this is Jung and Active Imagination, the introductory class, Active Imagination and Jung's Red Book. Welcome, glad you all came. My name is Dr. James Newell. I wanna thank you all for coming. If you're watching on the video, I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. So as I said just a moment ago, we're gonna talk about Jungian theory. We're gonna talk about Jung's Red Book and Jung's technique of active imagination. The class and the course that's going to begin next week are all a part of our attempt to fulfill the mission of the Depth Psychology Alliance, which is simply to make depth psychology available and understandable, if possible, to as many people as we can. Now, you notice I won't, uh, I'm going to, there's a lot of words on these PowerPoints that I'm sharing. I won't always, uh, if you're following along, I won't always be going along with that. Part of that is to keep me on track, and part of it also is if you sign up for the course, you'll have access. Whenever we do a class like this, um, you'll be able to download the PowerPoint afterwards so you can follow up on things that I've said on, on the main points and like that. So just to, to give you a little background about the Depth Psychology Alliance, it was founded 10 years ago now. It seems amazing to me that it's 10 years, but it has been 10 years. It was founded by Dr. Bonnie Bright uh, while she was walk, working on her doctorate at Pacifica. Uh, Bonnie was really interested in, in creating a platform and an online resource that would help uh, spread the word. She had discovered depth psychology, was just in love with it and wanted to spread it, the word to everybody. And I luckily, uh, happily was able to get on board with her early on as a part of the administrative board. And uh, she was handling everything herself. So she put a board together and she uh, was paying for everything herself and so wanted to figure out a way to pay for things. So we decided we'd try to put together a certification program. And uh, this, I'm happy to say, is the final of eight classes. So the there's, I don't know, I know many of you are with us today. There are many students who have done all eight modules. And at the end of this course, when they pass this course, they'll be certified as uh, specialists in depth psychology. And we're going to try and move all of these classes now to an online platform uh, for on-demand on videos, but I wanna make uh, new videos so they're not just rehashing the same classes, so they'll be a little bit higher quality, but they will be available. Hopefully the first one will be available in the spring. And as we've done this one little bit by little bit, they'll become more available. Now this class, Jung and Active Imagination in the series would actually be probably class number four it's coming last because we were just, we didn't know how it was going to be received when we first started. We didn't know if people were going to sign up at all. As it turned out, we've been uh, very happy to, to see how many people have benefited from the courses and been very enthusiastic. We've always had a full uh, complement of people joining the courses. So uh, we made it through and they're a little out of order the way we've done it, done it now. But when we put them online, hopefully people can follow them in order if they like. So what about today? What's today's class? Today we're going to look at a summary of where active imagination fits into Jung's theory of the psyche and his theories of doing psychotherapeutic work and the work of individuation. We're also going to discuss Jung's famous red book and how that red book relates to active imagination and to Jung's ideas about the psyche and its role in uh, personal and intellectual life of uh, his own personal and intellectual life and the intellectual life of people who want to uh, follow his uh, example. So um, we're gonna close the class today with a survey of each of the eight modules that will make up the full course that begins next week. So the first part, talk a little bit about the Red Book, a little bit about the method, and then we'll uh, kind of fill you in on exactly what we're gonna cover throughout the course, kind of a, a summary preview. Now, before we get started, I do want to issue a couple of disclaimers. First of all, although the Red Book is mentioned in the title of the course and is in the course descriptions, this is not a course about the Red Book per se. Jung's Red Book is fascinating. It's a complex topic. It could easily fill many courses, uh, depending on what area you focused on it. Uh, the reason we mention the Red Book in uh, a class on active imagination is because that's where the gestation of the, the method came from and the red book really is the sort of the performative the final step aspect of Jung's development of this technique and he later taught it to other people he never really uh, systematized it into a uh, codified system partly because he wanted the method 
to be dictated by the unconscious of the individual uh, engaged in it. But other people have sort of circumambulated his ideas and uh, come up with, particularly uh, Barbara Hanna has come up with some uh, good rules of thumb. And, and Jung did have some many writings actually on the topic, which we'll go over throughout uh, the course. So we're going to spend some time today discussing the Red Book, and the first two modules of the course will be dedicated to at least some discussion of the Red Book, but most of the remainder of the course will be on the technique of active imagination itself, which uh, created the Red Book. Uh, Jung's doing active imagination is what created the Red Book, uh, but the whole course will not be on the Red Book. So if what you're looking for is a course on the Red Book, uh, this may not be the course for you, but if you want to know more about uh, the technique itself, uh, hopefully you will find this interesting. Uh, so, secondly, um, even as a technique, active imagination is not for everyone. Uh, we'll go over we'll we'll go over some of what Jung called the process of individuation in a moment, because really to understand the technique, you know, have to know something about individuation because the technique is something that facilitates. Uh, we hope the process of individuation is a tool that we can use in that process but if we don't understand the process then it's a little vague what the uh, technique is for but um in short i would say that the the individuation process itself occurs in two separate stages stages the first phase the first stage involves the development of a strong ego structure what we could say a strong personality self uh, self-structure, some people call it, and it also requires a strong support system. Jung, when he developed this, was a successful man. He had a family. He had a practice. When he began, he was actually teaching at the university as well. He ended up um, putting that aside until he kind of did some more research and did more on this experiment, but the point is he was grounded in the world, and he would say that he would go into these active imagination uh, exercises and just feel completely sort of in another world. But he always had his family and his practice and his patients, and he had something to ground him. He had support systems and he had a sense of being grounded in the world. Uh, if we're in the first phase of the individuation process and still developing a strong ego structure, still working on finding our place in the world, then active imagination may be useful still in various uh, discrete ways. But to go into it whole hog the way he did, he was really experiencing um, uh, what we would call today a midlife crisis in many ways. And he used that sort of mature transitional period to develop the technique. And so it's, it's a technique that can be specific to specific times in life and for specific situations. It, it's a very, very powerful technique. And if we're not, if we don't take it seriously, if we're not careful with it, it can be more disorienting than helpful. And that will depend on, again, on what kind of support system we have and also what kind of a sense of groundedness we have in the world before we enter into it. Uh, and thirdly, I would say also, uh, I don't claim to be an expert in the Red Book, nor do I claim to be an expert on the, uh, the uh, practice of active imagination. What I do have some expertise in is understanding Jung's work, understanding the place of active imagination in his work, uh, understanding the place of the Red Book in his process of developing active imagination and in his own uh, healing process. And as we'll discover as we go through the course, and particularly the first several modules, really the proof of how powerful and how dynamic and how useful this technique of active imagination is the proof of it is that uh, Jung's the lion's share of the most uh, innovative, dynamic, really earth shattering discoveries that Jung made were as a result, he says himself, were as a result of the active imagination work that he did. And he sort of codified it and completed it as far as he was going to take it with the Red Book. And all of the work that he did, he was like 40 something years old when he began the process. And the next 45 years or so of his life were dedicated to putting what he discovered through that 
series of exercises, putting them into uh, into practice, putting them into a somewhat systematized understanding of the psyche and understanding of this. Uh, there's no mention of the individuation process prior to his work with the Red Book. That all came afterwards, as did much of what he had to say about the shadow, anim anonymous, uh, and certainly he was already theorizing about archetypes in the collective unconscious beforehand, but he really, really dug into it afterwards. So that's just to give us a little, little grounding and background, I hope, about the, uh, about the technique and just how powerful it can be. It certainly was powerful in Jung's life. So now finally, uh, these are my list of disclaimers. Uh, survivors of trauma, especially severe trauma, may not find the process of active imagination helpful, at least it would definitely, uh, it would be something you would not want to enter into without uh, the help of a safe space, a safe and competent therapist. And uh, Barbara Hanna, as I said, who's outlined probably more than anyone, how the technique should be engaged in and and because she worked, she did active imagination work in conjunction with her analysis with Jung. She was very close with Jung for many years. And so she has more insight than many. And she said that even uh, someone who's well grounded, we should ha always have sort of a lifeline, a friend, some confidant, whether it's a, a therapist or a group that you work with. Uh, she recommends highly, as did Jung, that the active imagination itself be done alone, uh, not not in company with other people, because it's something that's very much a dialogue, an internal dialogue that we're trying to uh, write down and, and document in some way. Uh, but but to afterwards be able to have someone that we can uh, trust, that we can run things by, and that we can use sort of as a lifeline. And as I say, a support system that keeps us um, connected to the world while we're doing these sort of uh, experimental. And Jung, a lot of people will say, oh, Jung had his, uh, El, uh, Henri Ellenberger, who wrote the, the book, Discovery of uh, the Unconscious, uh, it was one of the first people to put a positive spin on what Jung went through, and, and he called it a creative illness. And I, I do not consider it an illness at all. He says in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, and elsewhere, it was a conscious, deliberate experiment. He said it was an experiment, experiment that he entered into himself, not only for himself, but he thought, how can I tell my patients uh, to try these things and to do these things if I'm not willing to do it himself? So he dove into this, this process consciously, willfully. It was not something that overtook him like an illness that he had to get inoculated for. Anyways, that's my little rant about that. But uh, in short, engaging seriously in the process of active imagination requires the skill of being able to remain grounded in the real world while simultaneously exploring and engaging the symbol producing functions of the deep unconscious. And we're going to have lots more to say about all that as we go through the course. But that's just uh, sort of setting the ground for uh, the process as we're going to be exploring it. So uh, naturally, the question comes up, what exactly is active imagination? In short, active imagination is a practice, almost any practice. It can be done in many, many different ways, but it's a practice that facilitates a dialogue between consciousness and the unconscious. And the word dialogue is very important. It's not simply uh, what Jung and uh, other Jungians has described as, have described as passive imagination. It's not passive imagination where you just kind of sit, you're, you're guided by someone or you're, uh, you're just watching the pretty visions go by. No, you engage it, you confront, he called it the, his confrontation with the unconscious. In active imagination, we dialogue with the unconscious and challenge the unconscious and say, why are you doing this? What's this? What's the use of this? And Jung said, once we, uh, once we learn something from this process, it's important, a very, very important uh, step in the process is to take on the ethical responsibility that comes from what we've learned from this. In other words, if it doesn't affect our lives, if we don't integrate it into some sort of positive change, then we really haven't done active imagination. We've done more of what he would call passive imagination, where we just kind of watch these things float by. So how it's done can be accomplished in many ways. In fact, it should be pursued in a way that works best for the individual. In other words, the things that rise up from the unconscious and, and if it's gonna be a legitimate and authentic 
dialogue with the unconscious, then the unconscious is going to have a say in what happens. They say in military strategy that the enemy always gets a vote. Well, in this case, the unconscious gets a vote. It gets a lot of votes. It doesn't get all the votes. We have to make ethical decisions and, and dialogue and say no sometimes to the unconscious, but the unconscious definitely does get a vote. And, and for this reason, uh, that is because the technique should arise from and out of the individual, uh, Jung was very reluctant, as I've said, to systematize active imagination as a technique. He wrote wonderful um, sort of discourse on the topic called The Transcendent Function. He wrote it in 1916, but he never published it. Finally, someone found it and said, oh, you should publish it. And he agreed to have it published with few changes uh, and many caveats. He writes a little introduction to it with many caveats, uh, but that wasn't until 1958. So that's some uh, 42 years later that he finally allowed it to, to be published. So he didn't want to lock things in. Um, so a matter of fact, it, at first, uh, he didn't even have a name for it. He called it in this uh, article in 1916, he called it the transcendent function. Then at other times in letters and in uh, different articles and things, he'd call it the picture method. Other times they called it active fantasy or visioning. In any case, the purpose of the method is to establish and maintain a dialogue with the unconscious. And so naming it for Jung was not as important as uh, seeing that people really engaged uh, the unconscious in a serious and deliberate way. So uh, then the question comes up and Jung asks this himself in uh, his Transcendent Function uh, paper. He says, why would you want to maintain a dialogue with the unconscious? Isn't the unconscious a big enough nuisance without stirring things up and trying to uh, seek out further problems from the deep unconscious? Well, of course, the, the answer that he gives, and of course is, should be obvious, is that if um, the unconscious is working autonomously and in interfering with our lives in ways we don't want it to, the more we can sort of short circuit that and maybe either direct it or at least find out why the unconscious is behaving the way it is, and we can not be so much in the grip of the unconscious. And it becomes, we'll see in a moment, uh, it becomes part of this process of differentiating the ego, the conscious self from the unconscious. And for Jung, that's what it's all about. Always, ever and always, the more differentiated we can become from the unconscious, the more we are uh, making some sort of positive movement in the right direction. And uh, differentiation doesn't mean dissociation, doesn't mean we're completely uh, divorced from the unconscious, but we're very clear in our own minds where we are and where the unconscious is. We're more and more clear as we go along. And, and we'll talk a little bit mo more about that as we go along. So um, the, the re another answer, another way to answer this is to understand uh, where and how active imagination works in the broader theory that Jung constructed. And we won't be able, in this uh, short class, we won't be able to go into uh, an exhaustive exposition of Jung's complete theory, but uh, we will want to just touch on a brief summary now to, again, see how and why this is a technique that Jung found useful. So, as I mentioned earlier, the overriding uh, theme, certainly after uh, 1916, really after 1920 or so, the overriding theme of Jung's theory was to engage in the process of individuation or the process of becoming an individual. Jung made a clear distinction between two ways of thinking. One is directive thinking. That's the, the way that we, uh, this is another, this is something that he talks about in this transcendent function uh, essay. Uh, we spend a lot of time as we develop this, this early stage of the process of individuation, we develop a, an ego structure. As you can see in this little diagram on the right, we develop an ego, we separate it to whatever degree we can from the unconscious, for, we separate from our families, from our parents. We develop a role in the world. And, and as we develop that role, we develop a mask or what Jung called a persona. Now the very act of this directed thinking, first of all, it shuts down fantasy thinking, which is the other form of thinking that he talked about. But it also, the act of this directive thinking necessarily 
uh, puts aside other things, things that don't fit in with the persona. And that, as we'll see, and we'll talk about later, certainly more in the course, is how the shadow becomes created in this area of the personal unconscious. And there's, there's lots uh, more to say about that, but that's just a, a basic result of this directive thinking. Now, the fantasy thinking we sometimes think of as mythological or mythopoetic thinking. But uh, as we develop a strong ego structure and make our place in the world, we often, unless we're uh, certainly creative, very, very creative people have much more facility with accessing this uh, mythological or mythopoetic thinking. And today, of course, uh, so much of Jung's work has filtered into the culture that we're a lot more familiar with these ideas. I can assure you in 1916, uh, this was not common knowledge. It was a great uh, outcry just about Freud's ideas. One of the reasons Jung didn't talk more about active imagination was because people saw any kind of exercise like that as being regressive. Culture was moving forward through this directive thinking as far as uh, scientific and academically oriented people were concerned. It's this directive thinking, it's this rational movement toward progressive movement that is the, uh, the way of culture and the way of civilization. And Jung is talking about going back to this mythological way of thinking. Well, they saw that as being a regression. They saw that as being moving backwards, not forward. But as we'll see, really Jung was uh, identifying the sort of Achilles heel of culture and the way the world is today, which is that we've so cut ourselves off from this mythological uh, thinking, mythopoetic thinking, and this realm of our being that we're dissociated and we don't have access to really necessary healing energies that uh, through, we hope, dream study and active imagination we can reconnect with. So this developing of a strong ego or personality self amounts to the first movements of differentiating the ego from identification or participation mystique, participation mystique, uh, mystical participation with the unconscious. So this is a diagram from Edward Edinger's book, Ego and Archetype. And it simply shows that sort of graphically, clearly this is not, this is just a metaphoric way of representing it, but you can see there's total identification of the ego with the self here. Little bit of differentiation in figure two, little more differentiation in figure three. And then in figure four, there's a lot of differentiation. However, uh, if this line here connecting the deep unconscious with the ego, if that's not there, then instead of differentiation, we have dissociation and we have no connection with our instinctual roots. We have no groundedness, as uh, Jung might say. So the idea and the idea of active imagination and dream work and all of that is to keep us connected with the unconscious. And Eric Neumann first, and then later Edward Edinger uh, used the term ego self-axis, which is simply maintaining this dialogue with the unconscious. This uh, helps us to not only differentiate, but in an ongoing way, Jung said a lot of times patients would become very dependent on him or on other analysts, and that's because they, they had no, uh, their, their connection, their ego self axis sort of went through what he called the transference to the person uh, helping them. And he wanted to help people to be independent, so he wanted to teach them active imagination teach them dream work so that they could go off on their own and maintain this ego self axis, maintain this dialogue with the unconscious and their main, thereby maintain uh, better emotional health. Otherwise, if they don't maintain that, then they, in order to reconstruct it, they end up going back and back to therapy over and over again. So as I said, now the ego, the uh, very act of establishing this strong ego and this persona and the, the idea of having a particular identity in the social group necessarily means holding certain other tendencies in abeyance and not allowing them access to consciousness. As a result, the second phase of individuation uh, involves turning towards the unconscious and reconnecting not only with one's own past and repressed negative tendencies, but also reconnecting with our archetypal, uh, natural archetypal endowment as human beings. And this is just, a, this is from Esther Harding's book, The Eye and the Not Eye, and it's, a, again, a metaphoric, graphic 
representation of the idea of how we project the shadow into the outer, outer world, how the shadow in this area, on this half here, you can see that the shadow is in the personal unconscious. This dark area here is a personal unconscious, but it's also an aspect of it is connected to this archetypal uh, evil, archetypal uh, darkness. And part of the role as we work through active imagination and work with dreams and what have you is to not only accept and identify what is our personal shadow, but also differentiate it from this uh, archetypal shadow, this uh, archetypal evil, so that we're not, we certainly don't want to make conscious or uh, become identified with or, or possessed by these dark uh, sides of the archetypes. So this is um, a very, very thumbnail sketch of sort of the first uh, movements towards the process of individuation. But the, this last point that I made about the archetype and the differentiation between the personal unconscious emphasizes one of Jung's greatest innovations in psychology, which his rec it, yeah, which is his recognition of the collective unconscious, which contains archetypal structures built into the hardwiring of the central nervous system. Now, a lot of times people who aren't familiar with Jung or they hear about a collective unconscious, it sounds to them metaphysical that there's that means that there's a a mystical astral world where everybody is connected and that may be so there, there may be such a, an astral world where everybody's connected a metaphysical plane where everyone is connected uh through an atma paramatma type connection however that's not what jung is talking about he's talking about when he talks about archetypes when he's talking about the collective unconscious he's talking about an evolved uh, structures in the central nervous system and in the embodiment of each of us. Just as we evolve with, uh, everybody has, most people at least have thumbs, four fingers on each hand. We have a nose in the middle of the face, two eyes. We evolve with, with certain parallel structures. Everyone has similar structures in their physical body. Similarly, Jung says, we have similar structures in the central nervous system. And because of these structures, uh, energy psychic energy not when we say psychic it means of the psyche it doesn't mean the psychic hotline or uh, clairvoyance or anything like that when he says the uh, psychic energy he's talking about energy that flows through the psyche it's what freud would call libido so um when we have these structures as we have these structures as jung hypothesized then the psychic energy tends to flow towards these structures. These um, structures want to be embodied by the psychic energy. If those things are thwarted, if that energy is thwarted, it tends to lead to neuroses or some other uh, ailment, uh, emotional ailment. For Jung, modern people have become completely dissociated from this deep unconscious layer, the symbol generating center of the psyche, precisely because we've evolved in a particular way over millions of years and now the last 50,000 to 100,000 years where we've had civilization as we know it anyways, uh, it doesn't allow us to um, bring a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, all of these uh, archetypal structures online in the way our psyches and our physical bodies want them online. He felt that uh, maintaining psychological well-being in the modern world required that we maintain a connection with this symbol generating deep unconscious by establishing what some Jungians have called the ego self axis that we just mentioned. And <clears throat> when I say the symbol generating uh, center, uh, I'm talking about what he called the archetype of the self. And I know if you're not familiar with Jung, there's a lot of throwing a lot around a lot of um, different jargon. Um, I know many of you are familiar with some of these terms, but uh, as we go through the course, and of course, uh, just uh, 30 minutes from now or so, we'll have time. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them then, and or now, if you have a question now, uh, go ahead and interrupt. Um, we'll be happy to, to answer your questions. But I'm trying to kind of run through these so we get a, a sense of why uh, and when and how active imagination would be applied in this individuation process. And as I say, Jung's uh, theory is not that difficult 
uh, particularly because so much of it has already seeped into the culture, but there are many, many constituent parts. And so once we learn those, it becomes easier. And those of you who uh, go through the course, I think we can, I, I can help you uh, work through that if you're not familiar with all these terms. So the, this establishment of the ego self axis, which just means maintaining this dialogue with, between the ego and the deep unconscious, studying our dreams, engaging in active imagination exercises are the two primary ways that Jung recommended for maintaining the dialogue with the unconscious or for establishing and maintaining what we're calling an ego self axis. So obviously uh, that's a thumbnail sketch. There's much more to Jung's theory than this. And hopefully that just this brief introduction to the theory uh, can help you to better understand the need for developing and maintaining a dialogue with the unconscious and the role of active imagination in this process. And again, uh, active imagination is not necessary to engage in that process. There's many, many different ways to do it uh, throughout history, throughout evolved history. Uh, that connection has been maintained through uh, religious practice, through spiritual practice, religious practice, anything. As we know, uh, if you're familiar with the 12 step movement, which uh, Jung had a big influence on, the idea of remaining connected to and subservient to, recognizing that there is a higher power. In the psyche, that higher power is the archetype of the self. Whether there's a metaphysical higher power or not is up to each individual to, to sort of existentially grapple with. But uh, for Jung, it's enough that we maintain that sort of a practice of recognizing humbly this connection with the center of our own uh, psyche. So for Jung, as with Sigmund Freud, understanding and interpreting dreams is the primary way of connecting with and understanding the unconscious. For Jung, this also included identifying, understanding, and unpacking psychological complexes. Uh, Freud also was very invested in the idea of the complex for a while, but then when he decided that uh, Jung was a, um, a heretic, he yeah, sponged all the talk of complexes from his uh, theory. However, um, complex is central to a lot of well, understanding how psychic energy moves through uh, the system and all that. So uh, Jung found that even for himself, however, interpreting dreams can often be quite difficult. And even with must, much focused work, some dreams remain completely opaque for many years. And this was true for Jung. And one of the reasons he decided to confront the unconscious directly is that uh, some dreams are particularly when you're in the grip of a difficult situation that can be very uh, less than satisfying to, to try and figure out just what in the world the unconscious is talking about. So uh, this being the case, Jung decided to explore other techniques, which would involve more active engagement with the unconscious by the individual. And by the individual, I mean, in this case, strictly, it was him. It was, uh, he was, had been a, through a very, very difficult time in his life. He'd staked everything on first becoming a psychiatrist, which was very controversial. All of his advisors in school were just heart sick when he decided to become a psychiatrist. Psychiatry at that time was uh, lunatic asylums and uh, all kinds of, you know, oftentimes the patients were just as likely to make the doctor go crazy as the doctor was to make the patients get better. So the idea of, of this promising young student going into psychiatry just disappointed people. Then he invested everything on this relationship with Freud. He got heavily into psychoanalysis, which is also very controversial. And then having established himself as sort of the crown prince of psychoanalysis, he could no longer truck with uh, Freud's insistence on sexuality being everything, uh, all libido, all life energy, all of what Jung called psychic energy, for Jung, uh, rather for Freud, was determined by the sex drive. And Jung thought this just doesn't hold up, neither in the consulting room nor sort of philosophically. It just doesn't make sense that everything is uh, driven by that. What about hunger? What about uh, simple goodwill and simple uh, sense of, uh, of, of, of wanting uh, altruistic decency, which is survival? Uh, they found a lot of uh, recent research shows that there's survival benefit in that. And so that also is uh, something that drives people. So Jung's 
eventually he wrote Symbols of Transformation, which uh, Freud was a little disturbed by the first half of it, which was published first. But when the second half came out, he could see that, that Jung was, was directly challenging his theory of libido, and uh, they broke off. So here's Jung. He, he's staked everything on all of this, and then everything is gone. So he was in such a dire straits that he, he and his dreams were not helping him. So he developed these uh, different techniques. And many of you may already be familiar with the story of what he has called his confrontation with the unconscious. There's a chapter on that in the book, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And there'll be uh, some readings from that in our, uh, our readings for the course. Those of you who, if you take the course, you can take it as an audit. You can also take it um, for credit and get a certificate at the end. If you take it uh, to get the certificate, we're gonna be using for our textbook, a book called Encountering Jung on Active Imagination. And that book um, is really a collection, an edited collection of, I don't would say all, but many, many, many of the writings of Jung on the technique of active imagination or, or related in some way to active imagination. So, uh, so his chapter from MDR, uh, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, is, uh, is gonna be in that collection as well. So he had staked his entire reputation, as I said, on this. He had been now excommunicated from the psychoanalytic community. Uh, he had already begun to travel his own path with the publication of his book, Symbols of Transformation, but he still had no idea what to do next. So he's disoriented and he didn't know what to do. So he decided to perform this experiment on himself. He decided he was having, he'd already been awake to his dreams and paying attention to his dreams. And he'd been awake to the idea of uh, tracking uh, spontaneous visions and spontaneous things. Any, any sort of intervening thought from the unconscious, some unbidden autonomous thought from the unconscious. Uh, this is the method of psychodynamic psychology is to just track those things, see what's going on with it. So he decided to, um, focus on the different emotion he was feeling and seeing what would come up. Uh, the first thing his experimentation brought up involved a simple return to engaging in play like a child. Now, this sounds relatively benign for us today. This is, remember, this is literally over 100 years ago, however. And as I often say, Jung was really a 19th century man. So you can imagine a 19th century man absolutely dedicated to the proposition of directive thinking, rational thought, um, the uh, primacy of reason in everything that we do. And here he is, he's, he gets down on the floor with blocks and toys and, he, and he's playing like a child building little towns. You remember that he did this, he had hours of joy as a child playing and making little towns. And so he would go outside by the riverbank or by the lake shore and, uh, and make little towns and, and do all these things. Now, on the one hand, it sounds charming. Uh, for Jung, he said it was just a completely humiliating experience because he just, uh, this was not something that a professional psychiatrist did uh, in those days. But uh, while he was doing this, uh, very many, many childhood, childlike fantasies came up. He remembered some early childhood dreams and little by little, more and more fantasies and visions started to um, emerge from his play and from the, the time he was spending doing this. And then later actively uh, calling up these visions and dialoguing with some of the characters that would arise in these visions that came up when he was playing. So uh, eventually he decided to write these visions down in the formal calligraphic script. First he worked them, he wrote them down in what he called the black books. Why? Because they were just black notebooks. And people wonder why did he call the red book the red book? Well, because he, he commissioned a book and the book they gave him was read. I don't know if he asked for it to be read, but uh, it being read was not really as significant as the fact that he was writing these things down. First, he wrote them all down as they occurred in the black books. And so what the uh, red book was, is he began to calligraph, you know, very formal, as you can see in this little picture on the right, very formal German language calligraphy. And then he's he's got these, First, he started with some of these artistic renderings, which are like the old illuminated texts. You can see just a big letter on, on this. But then eventually he, he drew and painted some of the visions themselves. And he filled this book. And he worked on it for um, 
many, many years uh, doing this. And this process was um, very healing. And as I say, ultimately uh, formed the basis for uh, all of his work that followed. So he called this book, for he had the black books, and then he wanted a new book to put them in. So he called what he called the new book. He called it Libra Novus, which translates as the new book. He was he was very uh, concrete. People labor over what the symbolic meaning was, but basically it was a new book. He called it the new book, and it was red. So they also called it the red book, and that's the that's the mystery behind all that. So as I said, we'll spend considerable time on the Red Book, especially in the first two modules of the course. However, the real focus of the course will be to talk about the method by which and through which Jung created the Red Book in the first place. Uh, the goal, according to Jung, would not be for us to become too voyeuristically involved in Jung's own inner life, uh, in inner work, as fascinating as that is. Uh, that is to say that we shouldn't become too involved in studying his Red Book but rather, notice he, uh, he didn't want the Red Book to be part of his collected works. He did not even want it uh, published during his lifetime. As a matter of fact, he left off, I think sometime in the 20s, the early 20s, he left off mid-sentence in the, he just, he'd been writing in the Red Book and he left off mid-sentence and he did not go back to it again until about 30 years later. And then again, he left off a mid-sentence. Well, why did he do that? Because during that time, he was discovering alchemy. And alchemy was essentially an historical um, prototype mm. for this kind of visionary work that he had been doing with the Red Book. And again, well, we're going to have a whole module on um, active imagination and alchemy. So I'm not going to go too much into that. But he saw in the work that the alchemists were doing, that they would project, they would study these, you know, hard uh, chemical substances and processes that they would do with them. And they would imagine things were going on there that weren't actually going on in the substances, but were going on internally in the alchemists. And Jung began to see parallels between what the alchemists were doing and what he had been doing in his work with the Red Book. So um, he left off that, and uh, that was the beginning of him articulating over 40 years or more uh, his vision for psychology and for a psychology of the future, putting all these things sort of operationalizing, as they would say in experimental psychology, operationalizing all of these things that he had learned uh, during the process of both, uh, see in the Red Book, in addition to just simply writing down the visions and recreating them in art, he also reflects on the visions and sort of philosophically talks about uh, his place <clears throat> in uh, the intellectual history of, of psychology and the intellectual history of sort of Western thought. And he just goes in many, many different directions. But through that whole process, it helped him to develop what ultimately, little by little, he published in his professional work that he uh, did want included in the uh, collected works, what uh, what we know now as the, the massive... Uh, 20 or more volumes of the collected works. So with all of that in mind, I'd like, what I'd like to do now is survey some of the key components of active imagination. We'll go, of course, uh, into more detail with these as we move through the course. Each of these different techniques that we look at as we move through the modules will revolve around or relate in some way to these core ideas. So these are core ideas that Jung, um, saw as important when engaging in the process of, uh, or rather the, uh, the process, the, the exercises of active imagination. So central is emotion and complex. The idea is the centrality of emotion in the process and the relationship of emotion to Jung's idea of the psychological complex. For Sigmund Freud, uh, it was, the drive theory that was central to um, what moved things along. Jung was not, uh, part, of, part of his break with Freud was that he was not invested in the idea of a drive theory so much as tracking emotions because he saw the emotions as being related to the numinous qualities that came out from the archetypes and very much connected because the what, what we call numinous, I'm not gonna get into the whole history of the term or 
what it means, but it's sort of a, uh, an experience of the sacred, an emotional experience. When we have these really profound uh, experiences, Jung said that that's sort of characteristic of the experience of the encounter with an archetype. So we saw emotions as being central and related not to the drives, but to the complexes on one hand and to the archetypes on the other. Jung's original conception of the complex was as a feeling toned complex. It, it was shortened to complex, but originally the term was a feeling toned complex. There's an Israeli Jungian analyst named Errol Shalit who wrote a wonderful book on uh, complex and he sort of capsula, and encapsulated uh, Jung's ideas in this way. He says, this is a quote from Shalit, he says, complex denotes a network of associations, images, ideas, memories, or the like, clustered around a nuclear archetypal core of meaning and characterized and held together by a common emotional tone. Thus, still quoting Shalit here, thus the complex embodies three elements, an archetypal core around which personal experiences cluster and an emotional tone that serves as the gravitational force that holds this macrocosm together. And uh, many people will talk about it in, as being like an onion. On the outside is the surface symptoms, as we see in this diagram on the right. There's the deeper down, we get the associated, as we, as we kind of work on the complex, we get past the surface symptoms, see them as symbolic of something, hopefully. And so by doing that, we get to the associated uh, experiences, past experiences, personal experiences. And as we get more and more working through it, emerging from the center and highly numinously charged is the archetypal core. And why would there be an archetypal core? Because when we have highly charged, difficult experiences at any time in life, it's a certainty that other humans have had these experiences before. And that is what's archetypal about them. In other words, it's, it, they're common and, and it's often very healing just to recognize that what we think is a very personal, maybe shameful, maybe hurtful experience that many, many, many humans throughout history have had these similar types of experiences. And when we get to that archetypal core, we begin to then have access to this numinous energy, access to releasing emotion and getting a better handle on developing. Again, when, we, when we're connecting with the archetypes, we're beginning to A, differentiate the ego from the unconscious. We're less uh, possessed and sort of uh, encased in that unconscious world, but we're also uh, developing that dialogue and allowing that energy to flow so we have access to it to, uh, to do our work, to serve our families and our communities, etc. So when we embark on the project of individuation, the first thing we encounter on our inner journey, as we saw earlier, are the objects found in the unconscious, the personal unconscious. Jung referred to these collectively as the shadow. However, in practice, the elements, the sort of constituent uh, parts of the shadow that we encounter are what Jung called the complexes. As Errol Shalit suggests, we first discover memories and images of personal experiences after we usually we're drawn, uh, our attention is drawn to them because of some symptom, some, something that's interfering, the complex is uh, intervening in ways that we usually do not want it to intervene in our lives. So we explore into it, and as we tease it apart, we ex find personal experiences clustered around an archetypal core and held together by a common emotional tone, hence Jung's uh, term, a feeling toned complex. So our initial dialogues and other active imagination exercises would likely revolve in one way or another around whatever our individual complexes are. And again, not only are we going to have a perhaps an aptitude or a tendency towards a certain kind of active imagination, in other words, some people art, some people movement, some people um, writing things down. Jung, obviously very intellectual, loved myth. He'd just written Symbols of Transformation. So he wrote this very mythic kind of book in a mythic kind of scroll with his red book. Someone else, uh, for me to do that might not be ideal. For someone else, it might not be ideal. We want the our own uh, typology and our own uh, 
personal experiences and, and ideally our own complexes to dictate to one degree or another uh, where it's going to go. Because the dialogue, certainly at first, this dialogue with the unconscious is going to have to go through, have to deal with complexes in one way or another. So another, I'm, I'm trying to cover some key elements of what are going to uh, be a part of the process of uh, active imagination. So another is the idea of the image. In addition to emotion, in general, Jung put a great emphasis on the idea of the image. This does not always refer to a visual image. Following the French neurologist Jean Charcot, Jung identified images that correspond to different senses. Auditory images, which means sounds, could be music, could be uh, a voice speaks. Uh, motor images, which would mean uh, someone who dances, someone who wants to very, perhaps an extrovert or someone who just is into bodily movement would maybe get a motor image and that's how the unconscious would speak. Uh, on the other hand, it could be someone who has no contact with the body, but when the unconscious speaks, it moves the body. So there's all kinds of different possibilities. In addition to the more obvious, these are in addition to the more obvious visual images because we were drawn to, for example, this lovely image of Jung's from the Red Book on the right here, very dynamic, very beautiful, uh, but that may not be how everyone would uh, uh, sort of uh, document, that's what the word I'm looking for, document their active imagination process. We all would want to document it, it documenting it, codifying it in some sort of a concrete way, bringing it into the world is important, but we all might do it in a different way. So we can imagine then that the person who is more moved by sound might work with auditory images, hear words, music, etc., cetera, and uh, et cetera. As we said with motion, could be dance, could be yoga, could be um, just odd movements. There's uh, when we do the, the uh, module on motion therapy and movement and dance and all that, I hope to cover a little bit of uh, how Jungians have worked with Jacob Moreno's uh, psychodrama. So psychodrama is another way someone who's into movement and sort of externalizing things is something we could do. And of course there's painting, there's sculpture and other types of things to somehow bring out an image. Jung said that when he found an image that uh, communicated clearly, a symbol that communicated clearly his emotion, he felt immediately calmed and as if uh, energy was flowing, but in a uh, salutary way. So another uh, element of this, of course, is the technique of amplification. If you're familiar with Jung, um, once we've done some work with active imagination exercises, we're still left, as with dreams, you can write down your dreams, but you're still left with the task of interpreting either the dream or what we've produced as a fantasy. Uh, Jung interpreted such imagery in much the same way. In other words, he, he would interpret a dream uh, in the same way that he would interpret a, uh, uh, an active imagination exercise of some kind. The key technique for Jung in interpreting things was what he called amplification. When we amplify an image, we look for a known parallel in myth, fairy tale, alchemy, and other human artifacts. By amplifying the image through the use of parallels, the meaning as expressed in the parallel, in other words, we have a, a myth which has a particular, very clear uh, moral or clear stories being told. Um, if we can take the meaning in that story and read our dream or our active imagination thing in relation to that, we can, it helps us to tease out some meaning. The more parallels we can find, the more amplification we can do, uh, the better off we are. Now, the Freudian technique, which uh, Jung was not pleased with, was um, free association. And while free association can be useful and helpful, Jung said that the more we free associate, the more we get away from the affect. Uh, affect is sort of the, the word psychologists use for emotion. And Jung wanted to keep the work always around the emotion. So if we free associate away from the emotion, he would also come bring the person back to the core image and what is the emotion around the image. So when amplifying, uh, that also is a technique which brings you back necessarily to find out what the parallel is with the amplified uh, material. So an important aspect of amplification and interpretation is to remember that Jung was not simply looking to heal old wounds. 
Although this can be an important aspect of the first phase of the individuation process, Jung would call this a reductive or a retrospective interpretation. In addition to retrospective interpretation, which is say is essentially uh, rather essential in uh, early stages, but he also wants to find what he would call a prospective interpretation. In other words, how does the image help the individual to build a bridge to a more positive or desirable future? We're not just trying to find out, trying to stay stuck in the old world, but we want to see a prospective um, development that moves us forward into the world rather than simply staying stuck in the old wounds. We want to know how we can take that energy and give it a goal to work towards, a prospective interpretation, he would call that. So uh, how do we enter into the process? What would be the method or the starting point for the method of active imagination? So I want to look at just a couple of quotes from Jung on the topic. I know I'm, I'm kind of, I, it's one of the reasons I got these notes is because I get off track and I, I talk too much sometimes. So I'm getting crunched for time here, but uh, we may go a little bit over, but then we'll still have plenty of time for discussion if there's some questions. So uh, how do we get into that process? There's a quote here from Mysterium Conjunctionis. Oops, what, what's going on here? There it is. Um, so here's Jung. He says, and this is kind of an offhand thing that he just inserts in Mysterium Conjunctionis, but it's very telling. He says, take the unconscious in one of its handiest forms. Say a spontaneous fantasy, a dream, an irrational mood, an affect, or something of the kind, and operate with it. Give it your special attention, concentrate on it, and observe its alterations objectively. Spare no effort to devote yourself to this task. Follow the subsequent transformations of the spontaneous fantasy attentively and carefully. And then he goes on to say in uh, this paper I mentioned earlier, the transcendent function, he says, in order therefore to gain possession of the energy that is in the wrong place. He's talking about now displaced energy. He's, we, we want to use energy to accomplish something, but we're always, some autonomous complex is taking us in some other direction. So he says, in order, therefore, to gain possession of the energy that is in the wrong place, he, and forgive the, uh, this is 1916, so forgive the uh, masculine pronoun throughout here. He says, he must make the emotional state the basis or starting point of the procedure. He must make himself as conscious as possible of the mood he is in, sinking himself in it without reserve and noting down on paper all the fantasies and other associations that come up. Fantasy must be allowed the freest possible play, yet not in such a manner that it leaves the orbit of its object, namely the affect. Remember I said the, the affect, the emotion. He wants to give it lots of play, but not that it leaves where the emotional juice is, where the powerful, often numinous, but uh, highly emotional affect is. Always circumambulate that. The whole procedure is a kind of enrichment and clarification of the emotion, of the affect. And that's uh, again from, I think that's, uh, it's volume eight, I think that's the structure and dynamics of the psyche. So clearly the emphasis here is on the mood or the affect guiding the process. Another thing Jung emphasizes is the importance of noting down on paper what comes up in the process. Now, I think Jung would uh, agree with me if he were alive that uh, today it might be even more effective to use uh, an audio. Most people have a phone where you can record things with your phone uh, or there's, I have a software transcription program that I use. But something, in other words, to write things down, you kind of have to get out of the visionary state. You have to get out of the fantasy uh, mood state and get into sort of a directive thinking state. Whereas if you can just say the things out and have them recorded and then transcribe them later, uh, I think that might work as well. The idea is simply to make sure you have some kind of a document, uh, documentation of what has transpired. So then you can go back over it and, and work with it and, and hopefully provide yourself with some new understanding of where you are in the process and provide you with a basis to start maybe your next uh, experiment with the with the process so um finally uh there's the performative aspect this final step in the process is in a way related to the idea of noting things down this is the performance aspect and um 
Oh, sick. Yeah. By this, I mean to concretize in some way one's experience of the inner world. The act of bringing the impressions of the unconscious into the waking concrete world of things is, in a way, like replying to the unconscious. It sends a message to the unconscious that we take the unconscious seriously and that we understand and have respect for the reality of the psyche. It seems, uh, and I'm not the only one who's observed this, but that this is exactly what Jung was doing when he went to such great lengths over a period of many years to calligraph his visions, his reflections upon those visions, and to create works of arts depicting these visions. He didn't need to do that. He'd written them down. He was thinking about them. But he, he took it a step further and did this sort of performative act of writing them out in beautiful calligraphy, making paintings, and all this time, it takes a long, long time to do that. And all that time he's thinking these things through, he's giving them very real attention and very real importance. So, and additionally, uh, I think by doing that with the Red Book, he's created a symbol that sends a message to all of those interested in his ideas. That message might be that the unconscious is real, that the unconscious is important, and that communicating with the unconscious is serious and important work. And I've found, and I know many people found, that when we pay attention to the unconscious, the unconscious responds. If we don't pay attention to the unconscious, if we just say, oh, that's just a silly vision, the unconscious will stop sending us dreams and visions. But if we pay serious attention and do some sort of a ritual, performative um, concretization of what the unconscious has given us, the unconscious tends to respond. So um, exploring this kind of serious and important work is what we hope to do over the next eight weeks in this course, Jung and Active Imagination. So what I want to do now, and I'll kind of race through it quickly than I had uh, planned to, um, and we can, if there are questions afterwards, uh, we can go back and expand on this. <clears throat> I just want to cover briefly what we're going to do next week and the subsequent weeks uh, for all eight modules. So uh, module one will be the one where we spend the most time on the Red Book. We're going to look at the context of Jung's life when he began work on the experiments that led to the creation of the Red Book and all the different processes he went through and some of the, the contents of the Red Book, the, the Black Book, the um, we'll spend a lot of time with what Sonu Sham Dasani has to say about it in his introduction to the Red Book and exactly where and how uh, the process of individual, or rather the process of um, active imagination, how he developed it and um, how he later uh, employed it with his uh, other clients. Now, additionally, um, in the next module, we'll survey all of the, as many as we can, just a, a general sort of running through the kind of writings that Jung did about active imagination, Secret of the Golden Flower. I already read some of what he said in uh, uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis. Um, there's several different places where he writes with some uh, specificity about going through that process. And of course, there are places in uh, Memory, Streams, and Reflections where he, he can't say that he actually wrote that. He kind of dictated that, but he talks specifically about how he went through that process and developed the process. So we'll just survey all of Jung's writings on active imagination in module two. Then in module three, we'll try to do what Jung didn't do, which is to systematize um, the process and just come up with a general idea of general rules of what one, uh, the kind of environment that one works in, the steps that one goes through, regardless of what the different type of active imagination we engage in, what elements should probably, at least according to Jung's approach, should probably be there. And we'll draw a lot on Jung's uh, writings, particularly the transcendent function essay that I mentioned earlier but also uh, Barbara Hanna's um, reading of that because she spent so much time with Jung. She's one of the few people who wrote about um, her doing active imagination in her analysis with Jung. Uh, so there'll be a lot to, to learn from what she has to say about that as well. So then having got some groundwork, some background on all that, we're going to take uh, three modules where we'll go into depth in different 
ways of approaching active imagination that have been developed uh, since Jung's passing, primarily, as they say, on, of course, uh, focusing on the Jungian uh, take on these. There's lots of different art therapies, but we want to see precisely uh, how this has been applied in a way that uh, has utilized Jung's ideas about active imagination. So we'll start out looking at um, one of the most common uh, approaches to active imagination, which is art therapy. And we'll look at both how Jung worked with, uh, he's got a whole, and in our readings, there's a chapter where he, it's called the uh, study in the process of individuation, where he worked with a woman who did a series of paintings. So we'll look a little bit at that and some also some modern um, adaptations of Jung's approach. Then in module five, we'll look at, uh, as I said before, we'll look at movement therapies. The editor of our book, uh, Encountering Jung on Active Imagination, Joan Jodoro, is a Jungian analyst and a dance therapist who uses active imagination and dance. So we'll look at some of her writings. And as I said, we'll also look at uh, the way some Jungians have used um, psychodrama, uh, which is also movement oriented, though not exclusively movement related, but it's another way of um, some Jungians have used that process in a way of doing active imagination, not strictly the way Jung and uh, Barbara Hanna would recommend it, but it's related. All of these things have really grown out of Jung's original idea that came about in, in 1914. So uh, in module six, we'll then look at um, Dora Kalf's uh, application of Jung's techniques in sand play, which has become a really a worldwide phenomenon. She married the um, what's called the world technique by Margaret Lowenfeld with Jung. She was in uh, analysis with Jung and Jung encouraged her along these lines. And she's really done some amazing and remarkable things. And this really great work can be done uh, with active imagination and sand play. And we'll look at some of that in module six. Then uh, having seen some of the possibilities, we wanna go back again, look at active imagination in module seven, look at active imagination and alchemy. As we said, there's lots of, this is what kind of took Jung out of the work with the Red Book because he found that he finally had a, his, what he called an historical grounding, and sort of an archetypal grounding in the work of the alchemists. He first thought that he might find that in the work of the Gnostics, that did not work as well as he wanted. They didn't, didn't have the personal element that he wanted to find. But uh, what the alchemists did, particularly with the solitary alchemists, would just sit there with their retort and look at it and write down what they saw going on in there. He saw that as being a direct uh, parallel to what he'd been doing with his Red Book work. And uh, there's, there's lots to be learned from that. And then finally, as I said uh, at the beginning, in terms of uh, human evolution in history, the way humans for thousands and thousands and thousands of years have maintained this connection, this dialogue with the unconscious, this uh, uh, ego self axis, according to Jung, has been through religious practice and specifically through prayer, through dialogue with God. There's uh, Barbara Hanna mentions this lovely passage in, uh, in, uh, I don't know which book of the Old Testament is, but Rebecca, where she, where she talks about, I will go and inquire of God. This is the, the phrase that she uses to, uh, to make a decision about life choices that she has to make. And uh, Barbara Hanna suggests that this is precisely what she's doing is what we would now call active imagination. She imagines, and, and which isn't to say there isn't some metaphysical reality behind her active imagination, but uh, this process in different cultures, in different ways, using different approaches, um, we would say, you certainly Jung would say, it parallels as well uh, this process of active imagination. So we'll close the um, course with that and, and sort of see how modern people who, for whom the religious structures no longer uh, carry the numinous charge that they once did for human beings. We'll see how we can uh, make that sort of transition and make it work through uh, uh, combining or sort of dovetailing active imagination with uh, that process. So that is what I have to present to you today. 
I thank you all for sticking with me, and I hope uh, one or more of you may have some thoughts, some questions. I see that something's been going on with the uh, with the chat, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and does anybody have a question, thought, concern? Yes, sir. Um, Jim. I don't know if this is too difficult a question for you to, to address right now, but I'm really curious if there's a clear distinction or how you can help me distinguish between libido, mm -hmm. eros, mm -hmm. and psychic energy. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would say, generally speaking, the only distinction um, between uh, certainly libido and psychic energy, Jung would say they're exactly the same thing. The difference is Freud said that libido was exclusively uh, sexual energy, some sort of sublimated or displaced sexual energy, whereas Jung said, no, in other words, it's life energy. Any life energy that, that moves through the psyche is what you would call psychic energy. Freud said that it all originates with the sexual drive. And Jung said, well, that's just not, doesn't make sense. Uh, so that, so they, they, we could say they're identical. And, and it's certainly from a Jungian sense, we'd say they're identical. It's just that we're, uh, our theory is different. And Eros would just be um, a sort of a quality of, uh, if you divided psychic energy into opposites, you'd have Eros and Logos. That'd be one way to think of, of, of a kind of psychic energy. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and with what you just said, I think of Eros and Thanatos being opposites. Um, okay. You... And that, that could also be, yeah. I mean, th these are all kind of judgments and, and uh, classifications. Jung tended to oppose Logos and Eros. Um, and yeah, but, Freud would probably be more like likely to say Eros and Thanatos. Jung would say Eros and Logos. But yeah, I mean, one, yeah, life and death or uh, bonding and uh, rationality, you know, be the Eros and Logos thing. Okay, great. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. A good question. Thanks for asking. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Questions, concerns? I've got, um, I see uh, Adriana asks what book we're going to use. We're going to use the, um, if you're still here, Adriana, the uh, Encountering Jung on Active Imagination is going to be the textbook. Um, come on, somebody, I know somebody's got questions. If you're all hanging around, you must have some thoughts. You just unmute yourself and give me a question. I don't want to hog the stage, but I no, have me. another question. Sure. Another thing I'm interested in is the uh, the possibility of active event imagination in conjunction with a second person. And I know that psychodrama does some of this. But I wonder if you could talk for just a minute about uh, the, the uh, dynamics of, of how active imagination is altered by the addition of us of a sure well the uh, yeah and um a lot of those examples that i gave um you know the, those three modules we're covering different things they include many different methods of therapy and methods of approach that are uh that are include not just one more person but multiple people and now uh, whether or not Barbara Hanna and or Jung would call those uh, strictly active imagination is up for grabs. Probably not, um, but uh, as I said earlier, it takes a certain level of commitment, courage, uh, and um, maturity to do active, ima active imagination as Jung did it and as he described it is me dialoguing with me, me dialoguing with active complexes inside of me and, and active things that come up. Whereas uh, as soon as someone else is involved, for example, uh, Michael Fordham, who did a lot of translating of the collected works and, and was uh, new Jung and 
he's criticized a lot of uh, what during his time was contemporary uh, active imagination because he said when it was done in an analytical situation, uh, it was it told people it told the therapist more about the transference, in other words, the relationship of the patient with the doctor, than it did about their inner work. In other words, there's more transference there than uh, it, the the introduction of another person. It it, complica- it it may be just the right thing for some people. It may be an excellent thing, but it wouldn't be strictly what Jung called active imagination. It certainly wouldn't be what Jung did when he created the um, the uh, Red Book. What what Jung did when he created the Red Book, matter of fact, he may I'm not having. There were figures that at one time he experienced, for example, he that he would have experienced through Freud, but now they were kind of free floating because Freud is out of his life. So that whatever energy Freud carried for him, he would now dialogue with independent of Freud being there. Whereas if Freud was present or if some, you know, if, if my therapist is there and I'm dialoguing with this thing, the presence of the therapist is going to change the dynamic of what I'm doing. And that may be good. I may not be ready to, I may not really want to do it on my, or may not even have the sort of the motivation to do it on my own, unless I'm encouraged by somebody else. So it's, that would be the difference. And that doesn't mean that these therapies aren't, uh, aren't beneficial, aren't useful and aren't, uh, uh, uh effective, but, uh, they're just not exactly the same as what Jung talked about when he talked about active imagination. One of the things Jung did, and one of the reasons he would ask people to do active imagination is the way he worked with people is they would come maybe to Zurich for, the summer or they'd come for three months or something, they'd work intensively with him. And then he'd send them back home to the U S or wherever they were and tell them to keep track of their dreams, do their active imagination, and then come back next year and and pick up again. And the idea being, and the hope being that they would eventually not need him and not need to come back. They might come back as friends or whatever, but they wouldn't depend on him. Whereas the more people are involved, the less likely that is going to be. But, but again, that, that may be appropriate for some people at, at a particular time. Does that, does that answer that? Yes, thank you very much. Sure, yeah. Um, yes. Hi. Hi, yeah, hi, this is Richard. Yeah, hi. hi. Uh, I just had a question about the numinous. Um, yeah. You mentioned that in, in passing. And uh, if I understand the numinous, it's by Rudolf Otto. Is that his orientation? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, with Otto, it was the kind of a, a, a attraction, a tense, sort of a, was it the Mysterium, Tremendum, et Fascinans? And the they're, they're different tremendum. categories. Those are all different categories. Right. And but it's, it's, so you have is, a, a yeah. negative, a kind of, kind of um, horrific, horrendous, overpowering a- aspect of this numinous experience balanced by a positive um, uh, sort of sense of attraction to this numinous, uh, to this mis- mystery. Well, maybe, and, yeah, and then, maybe not necessarily balanced. Maybe, maybe balanced. We may okay. just be, be terrified. And by, yeah, by that, I yeah. mean, uh, but the fascination implies that you, you, if you were terrified, maybe you just, you just run away, or, or uh, whereas right, the fascination right. sort of, it's sort of almost being a spellbound or kind of yeah, captivation yes. that you, you, you're, you're, you're afraid, headlights. but you don't, you don't look away, and or you don't, you continue to engage. And I was wondering, in a kind of active imagination type scenario. What would be the mysterium tremendum, and what would be a typical example of a fascinate, fascin- fascinating uh, drop pull? Well, I, yeah, I don't know that I have specific examples, but the, that's one of the reasons that uh, you know Jung. It's, it, the thing is that the the danger with this is that you'll be really good at it. <laughs> if you're really oh. good at it, then you really yeah. will engage uh, with the archetypes, and mm-hmm. and by the nature, the definition of the archetypes is that there will be some at some point some experience of, of Fasanans and, and uh, Tremendum and all that, and, and the numinous. And so the idea would be uh, how, and, and Jung said it would be um, his experiences. He describes them pretty well in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And there's, yeah, you, when you, the danger is going to be on one hand that when you encounter that, mm-hmm. you're going to stop doing the exercises and just kind of go away. But now you've activated this energy, so the energy is not going to go away. It's going to be act, it's going to be working somewhere, and okay. you know, and the very um, the very purpose of a lot of these old uh, religious uh, practices 
was to recognize that you would experience that fascinans, that tremendous, that, that terror, and yet fascination, and you would bow before it. So mm -hmm. th there, there's got to be a certain amount of respect for the figures that come up from the unconscious. Whereas at the same time, if you just do that alone, that, that's some kind of a dialogue, but you have to be able to say, you have to be able to say, what are you doing? You're trying to kill me. You know, you're me, you're part of me. Mm -hmm. or, you know what? There has to be some kind of pushback against that. Um, and being able to maintain that, it, as you say, can be terrifying, but, but it mm -hmm. also kind of builds up a sense of, Hey, I'm not going to be overwhelmed by this. Uh, mm -hmm. Now Jung gives the example, for example, that uh, Nietzsche, and I'm not a, a Nietzsche scholar by any chance, by any means, but um, he says that Nietzsche did the same thing that he did. But actually, Barbara Hanna makes this comparison. Freud, uh, rather, Jung brings it up. Um, and Barbara Hanna says that uh, the difference was that uh, Freud, Jung had uh, family, work, he was established. Nietzsche had nobody. He was completely adrift. So it crushed him. He killed him. He, he killed himself oh. eventually. I mean, he just kind of uh, yeah. collapsed. Uh, but he had that experience, but he didn't have those networks to, to hold him in place. He had he kind of experienced the fascinons. He went through that whole, and he documented a lot of it, and it's a lot of beautiful writing, but it eventually crushed him, whereas Jung was able to survive it because he had uh. this lifeline type stuff. Interesting. Okay. So that, so that, I don't know if that's maybe the best example of, I have of that Fasanon's and Tremendum thing is that Nietzsche, I would say, experienced that in his uh, active imagination work. Uh, Jung himself said that Nietzsche did a similar kind of work to what Jung did, but he, Jung himself says that through great, great effort and sweat and, and difficulty, he was able to stand up to it also because he was a psychologist and Nietzsche was not, but, uh, <laughs> but he was able to stand up to it and Nietzsche didn't. So it, that's that's kind of the danger of the of the process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I could I could I could imagine. And that's that, why uh, in religious practices there's so many um, taboos and all that stuff. You don't go here. You don't go there. You bow down when you come to a certain place. Yeah, you're very respectful yeah. because that's the energy that you're projecting into the other fascinons and and you do not you do not treat that energy lightly. That's kind of the whole point. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Anybody I could, else? I could add to that, just from my own experience, I'm an artist, and, and I've really been, been engaged with these energies for many years. And for me, the, I really think in terms of the poles of the positive and negative energy, the positive being eros, and, and I always think of the negative as being thanatos. But for me, there's a, there's a really healing aspect to struggling with the things that you that you resist in your life and for me part of my shadow came up and and it just kind of grabbed me by the nape of the neck and i could not carry on with my life until i was able to to face this thing mm -hmm. and uh I, th I think in all of our lives we are confronted with some monster that forces us to move forward. And uh, in, a, in a wider perspective, even though it's terrifying at the time, there is really a positive aspect of, the, of that because the, uh, I think of God kind of putting our face in the middle of it and saying, if you want to have a full life, you have to face this stuff. And so I've tried to think of Thanatos as having this kind of dark healing energy Sure. Yeah. The, the thing is, though, um, you, uh, you know, working with art and working with, you know, some kind of you have some kind of structure in place that allows you to do all that. There are those of us who do not. And what you know, you're saying he forces you to face it. Well, some people, when they're forced to face it, they just they either die or they commit suicide or they you know walk out into the street and get hit by a car because they're so kind of disoriented. So that's that's the, the thing is that not, it, you know, this is. Now, this is why I was stressing that Jung was, he was already highly successful. He was already well-recognized. He had a, a, a many children. He had a wife. He had jobs and, and uh, a public life. Um, this is something that, you know, uh, a thousand years ago, people did not have uh, the, the leisure. There are too many survival uh, needs that have to be met 
that didn't have the leisure to do active imagination. They, they may go on Sunday to church and <clears throat> bow down to the fascinans, the uh, Mysterium Tremendum, but they, other than that, they had to go about getting the crops in from the field to make sure their child didn't get, uh, you know, drowned in the well or whatever. There are survival goals going on. So this is a very new phenomenon that we're even able to do this. It's, uh, it's new on the one hand because we have more leisure time, but on the other hand, we also, we have these structures, these uh, religious forms that once carried the numinosity are flat for many people. And as uh, Edward Edinger says, we have depth psychology now because we need it because there's just, there's no other way to connect to these numinous energies. There's no, the only, we, we got celebrities and we got politicians and we got wars and stuff and they're very numinous, but in a bad, not really in a good way usually. So, uh, so we, we, we do depth psychology work because we want to uh, connect to these things in a more life affirming way. And Thanatos, as you say, can be very energizing, but only if you have enough um, commitment to affirming life. Because someone who encounters Thanatos who doesn't have that kind of commitment or has been you know, traumatized terribly or has been beaten down by life so much that they just kind of surrender to death when they encounter it. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's a tricky business. But thank you for that uh, contribution. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% that that's, uh, th and that was Jung's whole point also, that bringing on some of that darkness is essential. He, he had a conversation with Barbara Hanna where she says that he said, um, well, your consciousness is not as bright now because of what you discovered in your shadow, but it's wider. You're, you're, you know that you're an honest woman, but you also have the capacity to be dishonest. And because you know that, you have sort of a wider consciousness, but it's not shining as brightly. It's not, you're not sort of lifting yourself up so much. So uh, do anybody else have a thought, question, concern? Hello. Um, I don't know whether you can hear me, James, but- uh, Yes, thank Rudy. You very, yeah, hi, James. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was brilliant. Uh, great well, thank to you. Talk to the topic. Uh, what I wanted to ask in particular was about uh, Young's Black Box. I don't know, mm -hmm. I missed the start of the call. I don't know whether you covered this. Yes. If you could speak a little bit about the black box and your opinion or understanding of it, that would be great. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. No, the black books are really the uh, document, the initial documentation of, and this is kind of, it's partly my reading, but I think it's pretty factual. And uh, uh, of course, the Sono Sham Dasani has a lot more to say about these in his introduction to the red books. But the black books are the documentation phase he, he had these visions. <clears throat> he knew he had to, you know, he said when you do the active imagination, you need to note down everything you see, all the dialogues. The black books are where he did that initially. That's while he's in the, in the throes of this process, he's writing these things down in the black books. Now, the black books, I'm trying to think, some maybe is a, I don't remember the exact percentage, but some percentage of the black books he never completed the, the red book is um, some portion of the black books written out in calligraphic form, painted, the visions painted, and him reflecting on how he understood the visions and how he related to the visions and all that. That's, that's what the red book is. And uh, he managed to get through a number of the black books, but he didn't get through all of them. So the black books are just like if you have a composition book or a spiral bound notebook near your bed where you write down dreams or you write down visions. That's what his black books were. Does that make sense? Yes, that's brilliant. Thank you. I know that they're going to be uh, published in uh, the summer by the yes. Philemon Foundation. So uh -huh. I would, um, I'm really curious about um, seeing the process between the black books, what made it to the red books, and there's things that probably didn't make the cut, but I'm quite interested in-, in Yeah, and the, I wouldn't say that it didn't make, the, there's some that didn't get into the red book, but I wouldn't say necessarily that they didn't make the cut. It's just that he, I think, and actually, I, I don't know this, but I think he went chronologically, just tried to get them all down, but it took him 10, 20 years to get, or certainly many years to get down as much as he got down. And then he had moved on to alchemy and other things. And the, um, the, the black books, as I say, the, the black books are the documentation phase. For me, uh, the red book is the performative phase. This is where he's, um, it's, it's so elaborate and so sort of over the top in, 
in presentation that it's it's a message from Jung to his own unconscious of how important these things are. So he 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 documented them. Not he could have just left them in the black books, reflected on them, and said, "Okay, I'm going to move on." But this is the final step of any act of imagination where you do some ritual, some performative act that brings it concretely into the world in a way that is equivalent to like bowing your head and saying, yes, I, re I respect and am thankful and grateful and profoundly respectful of what the unconscious has sent to me and to show you that I'm doing this. And what he did was create these beautiful paintings and the lovely calligraphy and, and the reflections on it taking hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to, to create this thing. And that's what I'm calling the performative aspect of putting it all into a, and he did it in a very medieval style and he had dreams and things that, that told him that he, he needed to kind of get back to that period. And so that's kind of how he, that's his first step to doing that. And then when he found uh, alchemy, that's when he really, as he called it, he entered into the 17th century for a couple of decades studying the alchemical texts. And that sort of was the final sort of uh, affirmation to his unconscious that he was acknowledging that process that he'd gone through. Thank you very much, James, for making the distinguish the dis distinguishing feature between documentation and the kind of reverent performative element and the jump between the black and the red books. That's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Well, uh, I'm happy to hang out. Uh, we've been doing this for an hour and a half now. If anybody has any more questions, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I'll close up. Any thought? Yeah, I see a hand, Skylar. Hi, how are Hi. you? Good, how are you? Good. Um, could you imagine a situation where one of the ways that you would actually um, channel it into something that's performing is to turn it into a story? Oh, sure. Matter of fact, and yeah, that's something that, yeah. you know, uh, also Barbara Hanna, uh, I didn't mention the name of her book, but Barbara Hanna's book is Encountering the Soul, Active Imagination as Developed by C.G. Jung, I think is the name of it. And in there, she, she recommends that as a, as a technique to actually turn it into a story, write out a story. And uh, I couldn't tell you all the details of that, but yes, that's definitely a, a, a very uh, legitimate way to deal with it. See, and really any way that speaks to your unconscious, as long as you're with the affect and, um, and, and not kind of dissociating or it's a lot of things we can do that kind of actually take us away from it and our ways are, are like defense mechanisms, a way to avoid encountering the really scary reality of who we are and what we're wrestling with. Uh, if we're doing something that takes us away from that, then that's kind of avoidance and dissociation and uh, is not helpful. But if you're, if you're writing a story that really brings that out then absolutely that would be a very positive thing would it be a misuse of it to use it as an impetus to the creative process in general well that's another question that's an interesting writer, question you know. yeah yeah well it's a see that here's the yeah that's that's a somewhat more complicated question i know because uh, well the thing is and this is another thing I'm, i keep going back to barbara hannah because she's much more articulate about the process than jung is jung didn't want to make any rules she was <laughs> a little more willing to make rules <clears throat> but one of the things she says is that um, the idea is that we are to be subservient to the deep unconscious and when we for example if we take a person a living person and put them into the into the act of imagination or if we do something like you're suggesting where we're making it a uh, a part of a, an artistic project there's not only the the question of the aesthetic of it am i am i paying more attention to the aesthetic than i am to the process of of confronting my unconscious so there's that element but the other element is she just she compares it to like doing black magic where you're you're trying to use the uh, the powers of the unconscious for some personal gain rather than completely just letting go and and letting it be uh uh, something that you just uh, are thankful for the gift that's been given to you. Now, uh, and, and you know, Jung's, some of Jung's art is not really what I would call great art. It looks more like elaborate doodles. Some of it really is very impressive, but he never, you know, he never used it. At, and, he, and he had a big, he had a, if you read his, um, his chapter on it in, in Memory, Streams, and Reflections, he talks about 
fighting with this anima figure who kept telling him, Oh, you're a great artist. You're making great art. And, and he was like, no, no, it's, you know, but that, so that kind of, those are the questions that you have to wrestle with. Am I doing black magic? Am I using it for personal gain? Am I really, uh, am I putting more uh, effort into the aesthetic of it than I am into struggling with my own uh, confrontation with the unconscious? And am I, you know, this dialogue that Jung had with, with his anima about, am I creating art or am I doing something else? So I can't answer the question, but those are the ones that you would probably want to wrestle with. Does that help? Okay, any, uh, any other thoughts, questions, concerns? Hi, James, this is Anne. Hey, Anne, how are you? Hi. Yeah, I'm good. And just, good. just wanted to say thank you so much for bringing together all this really, um, this you know, wealth of material that, that is um, so rich and so energized on active imagination. And I'm really looking forward to the course. Great, well, thank you. Good to hear your voice again. And look forward to seeing you. Uh, if there's nobody, any other questions, let me know quickly. Otherwise, I'm going to say thank you all. And I hope you will think about signing up for the course. We're going to have fun. We've had uh, really active uh, discussions after every, um, every class in the previous courses. And uh, also, I just want to mention we have an online uh, platform where you'll be able to get a lot of different uh, resources and videos and different things. And of course the classes will be recorded and they'll be available on the online platform. So I uh, hope to see you all in the class. If not, see you uh, next time we do one of these. And thank you all very much. Take care.